1919 was an auspicious year in history. The First World War ended, ushering a drastic change in the world order. The Philippine Islands had been a U.S. territory for two decades and was promised independence under the Jones Law of 1916. Progressive reformers saw the country and its people as a major target for modernization, and education was its main weapon. Seven forward-looking Filipinas came together in 1919 to create a school where young women could gain the knowledge and skills that would make them modern women. Paz Marquez Benitez was the first president of the Philippine Women's College. Jose Abad Santos was its first chairman of the Board of Trustees. Francisca Tirona Benitez was the second president and with her husband, Dean Conrado, guided the school from a house on A. Flores Street to its iconic Taft Avenue campus. In 1932, the college became a university, making PWU the first university for women in Asia founded by Asians. It provided a space where innovations in education flourished and young people were encouraged to be the best that they could be. For over 100 years, the Philippine Women's University has been known as a leader in quality education. In 1934, PWU moved into its main campus on Taft Avenue, and since the 1970s has been co-educational. Located in the heart of Metro Manila, it is easily accessible by public transport and surrounded by affordable housing. Today's PWU offers undergraduate and graduate courses in several fields of study. Its business and management programs are responsive to the needs of industry using evolving technology for global competence. PWU graduates excel in arts and sciences, education, social work, and diplomacy. Its fine arts and music programs have produced outstanding graduates through a holistic education that treasures heritage as well as excellence. PWU has pioneered in fields such as food science, nutrition and dietetics, medical technology, pharmacy, and nursing. PWU continues to play an essential role in producing graduates who possess the skills that make them competitive in the country and anywhere in the world.
everyone my name is AK Okol and I am an I am professor at Philippine Women's University Masters of Fine Arts and Design Department we welcome everyone to our first lecture event series and we are starting off with the second uh, the second of the of the event series it gives me great pleasure to introduce again our esteemed speaker, Dr. Thomas O. Hackinson, in his second lecture about the avant-garde titled, Understanding the Western Avant-Garde. We also acknowledge the presence of the Dean of Fine Arts, Dean Josephine Toralba and MFAD coordinator, Prof Professor Mervi Pueblo. Before we start, May we remind everyone to remain muted at all times during the talk so as not to interrupt the whole event. We would also like for everyone to turn off their webcams in order to prevent any possible connection interruptions while the speaker is talking. As per Dr. Hackinson's preference, we will collect all questions in the FB Live and Google Meet for the questions and answers portion at the end of the lecture. The lecture will be led by Dr. Thomas O. Hackinson. Dr. Thomas O. Hackinson is an associate professor at California College of the Arts in San Francisco, California, USA. His areas of scholarly interest include the artistic avant-garde as well as historical and cultural studies of science and technology. He holds degrees for the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, and Drake University. He has received awards and fellowships from the United States Fulbright Program, the Social Science Research Council, the Max Planck Institution for the History of Science, the Deutsche Akade Akademische Austausch Dienst, and the Berlin Program for Advanced German and European Studies, among others. Hackinson is co-editor of the book series Visual Cultures and German Context, and has co-edited several anthologies, including Jürgen Habermas and the European Economic Crisis, Cosmopolitanism Reconsidered, the volume Representations of German Identity, and also the collection Becoming Trans-German, Cultural Identity Beyond Geography. His monograph, Grotesque Visions, The Science of Berlin Dada, was published in June of 2021 in the New Directions in German Study series. And he also edited a volume with Dr. Jennifer L. Creech, drew out in early 2022, titled How to Make the Body, Difference, Identity, and Embodiment with Jennifer L. Creech. Today's lecture is of great interest to the PW community. Today's topic delves deeply into the movement of the Western avant-garde through its context within the Great War, the following global conquest and colonialism, and how it affected discourses about avant-garde aesthetics. Ultimately, the key feature in this discussion is the ever-evolving definition of art, its priorities, and core principles during a troubled time. Please join me in listening to Dr. Hackinson's lecture.
Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me here today at Philippine Women's University for the second in my three lectures and our three discussions about the concept of the avant-garde. Today's talk focuses on understanding the Western avant-garde and the last lecture, which will take place on November 25th, focuses more specifically on Dada and the concept of an historical avant-garde, two topics which I'll touch on today. But let me just say thank you again for being with me here today and a big thank you to Mervi Pueblo for making these lectures and our discussion uh, with you all at Philippine Women's University possible. The way in which the avant-garde developed in the West helps explain the avant-garde's problematic past and its critical potential today. This lecture outlines this development, including the avant-garde's disturbing relationships to colonialism and revolution. In our previous discussions, we focused on the Western Enlightenment, the utopian socialists, and the origin of the concept of the avant-garde in the early 1800s. Today's lecture will focus on aestheticism in the arts, World War I, the development of what Peter Berger described as the historical avant-garde and the emergence of the Dada movement in the early 1900s. In our next lecture, the final in this three-part series, we'll focus more directly on World War II, the neo-Dada movement, and the avant-garde today. We ended our last lecture, the first in the series, talking about the origin of the term avant-garde. And remember, this term comes from around 1825 and is attributed to the utopian socialist Henri de Saint-Simon. And his text in 1825, in translation in English, titled The Artist, The Scientist, and The Industrialist, identified the artist as one of three key figures in paving the pathway for a new kind of society to emerge. The increase in popularity of aestheticism in the second half of the 19th century helps explain both the ways in which the avant-garde detached from the practices of everyday life, and then, according to Peter Berger, led to the development of what he described as the historical avant-garde in the early 20th century. So let's take a moment to talk about what aestheticism is. Aestheticism was a mid to late 19th century focus on aesthetics and effects, rather than on art having a social or political representation or engagement. The primary criterion of value was beauty itself. We sometimes use the phrase in French, la pour la, or in English, art for art's sake, to describe the focus of aestheticism. Aestheticism was concerned only with art and not with society's troubles or political problems of the day. A discussion of aestheticism and its many wonderful examples in literature and the visual arts might include the work of Aubrey Beardsley, seen here on the right in an oil on canvas painting from 1895 by the artist Jacques-Emile Blanchet, which hangs now at the National Portrait Gallery in London. Beardsley's illustrations, including the wonderful The Dancer's Reward from 1904's Salome, a tragedy in one act, seen here on the upper left, showcase aestheticism's fixation with decorative styles and aesthetic effects. Thinking through aestheticism's larger context, however, issues and events leading up to World War I from 1914 to 1919 demonstrate why avant-garde artists began to question the idea that art should be responsible only to itself, that art should be made only for art's sake, la pour la. In the image on the left from artist Ochille Beltrame, we see the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria, heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary on 28 June 1914 by Gavrilo Princip, who was a member of the Serbian nationalist group Black Hand. 
Princip's assassination of Archduke Ferdinand led to the declaration of war on 28 July 1914, a war that lasted approximately five years, ending in November 1918 with formal surrender marked by the Versailles Peace Treaty of 28 June 1919. Importantly, World War I is also known as the Great War, not simply because it was the first of what would be two major conflicts in the West in the 20th century, but rather over 70 million military personnel were involved in World War I, and an incredible 16 million died via trench warfare. Many other events, however, preceded the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand and importantly led to tensions among European countries and the inevitable conflict that became known as the Great War. One of those major catalysts was the Berlin Conference of 1884 and 1885 sometimes known as the Congo Conference or the Congo Conference or the West Africa Conference or the West African Conference. It was during this event that European powers met and divided up the continent of Africa, determining which parts of Africa would be their colonies and which parts would be the colonies of other countries. The Berlin Conference, of course, was not the only example of European colonial aspirations and destruction. This map from 1914 shows the extent of colonial territories, those of Europe, as well as Turkey, Russia, and Japan. The Berlin Conference of 1884 and 1885, however, marked a particularly significant point for Germany. It was at that event that Germany declared its territorial ambitions and took control of portions of Africa, including Deutsch Sudwest Africa, which today includes portions of Namibia. Germany's colonial exploits have been relatively little discussed until recently. However, the Herero and Nama genocides from 1904 to 1907 mark a particularly egregious and horrific example of European colonization and murder of indigenous populations. On the left, you see a postcard depicting the Herero resistance in German Southwest Africa, Deutsch Sudwest Africa. On the right, you see a satirical cartoon from the magazine Der Wache Jacob from 1906, which depicts the cavalier attitude of German politicians toward the murder of indigenous populations in what is now Namibia. I introduced the issue of European colonialism broadly and German colonialism specifically because avant-garde artists in Germany and in Berlin in particular actively engage this history in their critical artistic practice. It was Peter Berger in 1974 who articulated his theory of the historical avant-garde somewhat in this vein. Peter Berger outlined in his 1974 book, Theory of the Avant-Garde, an important new understanding of avant-garde development in the 19th and 20th centuries. More specifically, Peter Berger argued for the concept of an historical avant-garde, which emerged in the early 20th century in response to European enlightenment failures, including issues of global conflict, such as World War I, and the horrific exploitations of colonialism. With his concept of the historical avant-garde, Peter Berger claimed that early 20th century artists operating under the banner of the avant-garde sought to return art to what he called life praxis. In other words, early 20th century avant-garde artists rejected not only previous kinds of artistic activity and experimentation, but also the very idea that art should be separate from everyday life. These historical avant-garde artists 
demanded that art must have a social function. Importantly for Berga, aestheticism or la pour la was a necessary phase for this newfound historical avant-garde criticality. Quoting Berger, one of the reasons this dissociation was possible is that aestheticism had made the element that defines art as an institution, the essential content of works. Institution and work contents had to coincide to make it logically possible for the avant-garde to call art into question. End quote. Even as aestheticism sought to detach itself completely from social and political issues, aestheticism also made clear that art had a particular function to serve in the society from which it detached itself. The new avant-garde of the 20th century, what Berga described as the historical avant-garde, did not aim to reproduce a quote unquote means and rationality, that is a kind of instrumentalization of art. Rather, the new avant-garde responding to asceticism proposed a quote unquote new life praxis, that is a new way of life. According to Berger, quote, asceticism had made the distance from the praxis of life, the content of works. The praxis of life to which asceticism refers and which it negates is the means and rationality of the bourgeois every day. Now it is not the aim of the avant-gardists to integrate art practice, art into this praxis. On the contrary, they assent to the aestheticist rejection of the world and its means ends rationality. What distinguishes them, and in particular here, the historical avant-garde from aestheticism, is the attempt to organize a new life praxis from a basis in art. In this respect also, aestheticism turns out to have been the necessary precondition of the avant-gardist intent. Only an art that contents that whose only an art the contents of whose individual works is wholly distinct from the bad praxis of the existing society can be the center that can be the starting point of the organization of a new life praxis. And The important development of avant-garde self-understanding that we have seen so far, going back to Henri de Saint-Simon, advocating a kind of utopian socialist idea for the avant-garde as the vanguard of a new society, to arts focus on new styles and techniques as exemplified in aestheticism, is then embodied, according to Peter Berger, by the avant-garde's rejection of this avant-garde trajectory. The Dada movement lasting from approximately 1916 to 1923 for Berger represents the epitome of avant-garde criticality. He associates the Dada movement with the emergence of what he describes as the historical avant-garde. We'll explore that concept even more in our next lecture. But for now, the important point for Berger and for us is that Dada broke from existing reflections on styles and techniques and took art itself, art's role in society, art's role in politics as its most critical foci. On the left, you see an image from the first and only international Dada fair. This one, the Est Internationale Dada Messa, or the first international Dada fair, took place in July and August of 1920. It represents Dada's critical efforts to expose the failed Enlightenment project in Europe, as well as critique the way art as an institution had become complicit with colonialism, destruction, and warfare. Members of the Berlin Dada group are oftentimes segregated into two or three clusters. There were anarchists, Johannes Bada and Raoul Hausmann, interested supposedly only in chaos. There were political communists, John Hartfield, Otto Dix, and George Gross, whose work contained overt, challenging, critical political messages. And then there were epistemologists, Hannah Hüch, the lesser known Till Bruchmann, and also the philosopher Salomo Friedlander, 
who challenged the way in which art was thought of as a critical tool in early 20th century society. One of Hannah Hirsch's photo montages exemplifies this kind of historical avant-garde criticality outlined in Peter Berger's work. This piece on the right bears the cumbersome title in English, Cut with the Kitchen Knife Through the Last Weimar Beer Belly Cultural Epoch in Germany. It was from 1919-1920. In German, the title is even more cumbersome. Schnitt mit dem Kuchen Messadara durch die letzte Weimarer Bierbauchkultur Epoche Deutschlands. The work depicts a myriad of artistic, cultural, political figures, all commenting with their Dada antics on the social and political activities of the day. Among, among the many key figures, Katja Kolwitz's head floats in the middle of the image. Albert Einstein, the physicist's head is detached from any body and floats in the upper left-hand corner. And the bottom right-hand corner shows a map with Hannah Hoek's own face collaged on top of it. And the map is a map of countries in Europe, which by 1919 had already given women the right to vote. Hannah Hoech was perhaps one of the most provocative, if underappreciated, artists among the Berlin Dada group. She participated in the aesthetic political antics of the first International Dada Fair in 1920 and made collages that contributed to critical discussions of political and social events in Germany and Europe. But her series from 1919 till 1930 called Aus einem Ethnographischen Museum, or From an Ethnographic Museum, commented directly on European and German colonial practices. Here we see an example from the series, 1929's Fremde Schönheit, or Strange Beauty. In the series, Höch would juxtapose images of white European female submissiveness and colonial objects taken or stolen from colonized countries sometimes even colonial peoples represented in juxtaposition with the white European body. In so doing, he hoped to disturb the viewer's perspective, challenge the way in which the European viewer saw, thought about, and related to their own self and the European colonized other. He continued many of the same critical artistic strategies that she used in Fremde Schönheit or Strange Beauty in the other 19 to 20 photomontages from her Aus einem Ethnographischen Museum series. On the left we see Denkmal 1 or Monument 1 from 1924, Die Süße or The Sweet One from 1926, and Ohne Titel or Without Title from 1929. These works all incorporate objects, artifacts, and in some cases, even body parts of colonized peoples in juxtaposition to images and bits and pieces from European bodies, often white European bodies. This strategy of juxtaposition he used suggests that the European and the non-European were not that separable, that the colonizer and the colonized were not in a hierarchical relationship, but rather interconnected, brought together in the Aus einem Ethnographischen Museum series in a critical, satirical, even playful fashion. We will continue to discuss Hannah Hirsch's important photomontage series, Aus einem Ethnographischen Museum, or From an Ethnographic Museum, during our lecture and discussion next month in November. We'll also compare in greater detail the way in which the Dada movement from 1916 to about 1923 succeeded and according to Peter Berger, failed in reintegrating art and the praxis of life. We'll spend some time discussing World War II and its impact on the avant-garde by outlining some of the key strategies, tactics, and development of the neo-Dada movement from 1952 to 1970, and then turn to the avant-garde today, 
looking at the ways in which data in China in the 1980s and black data today represent extensions of the data effort to bring social and political voice to avant-garde artistic practice. With that, I'll end my lecture for you today here at Pacific Women's University on understanding the Western avant-garde and look forward to questions and discussion with you all either in this online live time format or via an email. On the bottom of the screen, you'll see my email address. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Hackinson. That was a very insightful presentation. Um, maybe now open the floor for the question and answer portion. Um, Ms. Rona and I will read the question sent to us from FB Live and the Google chat box. Please type in your questions. Um, due to time constraints, we might limit the Q&A to at most, I think, three questions, if that's okay, sir, sir, I, Professor Thomas, Dr. Thomas. Yeah, that's okay. And you can certainly call me uh, Tom, if, if you like, that's okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I'll just say, I, I'm, I'm with you today from San Francisco, from the campus where I teach. So uh, apologies if there's any noise in the background and apologies that I'm thinking about the Pacific Ocean uh, because I'm very close to the Pacific right now. So I said Pacific Women's University at the end of my talk. And I, of course, meant Philippine Women's University. So apologies. Okay, it's totally okay, sir. We, we, it happens to the best of us. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Um, I, I kind of want to geek out <laughs> because the lecture was about Hannah who, and she's one of my favorite artists and I believe she's very, very underrated and I love her. Like I always rave about her works. So um, I'm very much excited for the next lecture as well about that. Like it's rare to find um, information about her work. <clears throat> Yeah, sorry, sorry. Just I was clearing my throat. I could also geek out with you about Hannah Hu. I I can encourage you if uh, when travel is allowed. Um, the the wonderful thing about Hannah Hu's work is that, um, and you may know this, A.K. That um, she buried a lot of her material. Um, she stayed in Berlin when the National Socialists, the Nazis, took power, and uh, she was a queer woman. Uh, she had relationships with both men and women. Oh my God. And, was quite anxious. Um, she was in a, a fairly uh, long-term relationship with the Dutch writer Till Bruchman, who I mentioned in the talk. And um, they were fairly anxious when the Nazis took power among among many of the groups that were ostracized by the Nazis were, were uh, queer men and women. And Hannah Huch buried a number of her uh, artworks, artworks that she owned by other artists, as well as a lot of her uh, materials that she used to create her work. She buried uh, those things in her garden, in her backyard in uh, Northern Berlin. She lived in the Northern part of the city and then only dug them up once the war was over. And she lived wow. in Berlin during the entirety of World War II. So it's, it's, uh, it's a fascinating story. And uh, she passed in 1978. So she had quite a long tenure and was, was taken up uh, more broadly, I think in the 70s, uh, later in her life, by um, some members of the German art and, and museum communities, uh, but then really didn't get a widespread attention, I think, in the West or beyond um, at, until the 90s. And AK, you may know this, um, the exhibition that I also uh, kind of associate with my own discovery of Hannah Huch as an artist was staged in, in 94 uh, at the Walker Art Center in, uh, in Minneapolis, where Peng uh, Peng Wu, who's on the, the group today, and Mervy and I all know each other from Minneapolis. Um, but that exhibition in 1994 was the first retrospective of Hannah Huch's work uh, and called very specifically the photo montages of Hannah Huch. And we could spend time tonight or, or next next lecture or in a future conversation about 
the strategy of photomontage, which was a very particular kind of artistic practice that some folks argue, including the curator of the exhibition, the curators, Maria Makala, one of them argued that and who invented this particular artistic practice known as photomontage. Wow. So interesting person. So I was, I, I was actually thinking, like, did she actually invent photomontage or like collage or was there a, because I've always been thinking about that. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, you know, there, there's some debate. Obviously, there's a, uh, there's a history of collage prior to Hannah Hoek in, in the 1910s and 1920s. Um, but what was particularly unique to her role and, um, Sometimes folks uh, will associate the development of this particular strategy of using real photographs and even photo illustrated reproductions of photographs as part of a collage artistic practice uh, with, with an activity that the German military used in the late 1900s and the early uh, 19th century, early 20th century, excuse me, uh, where they would have a cutout of a soldier's body and then uh, would take the, the picture of uh, a particular soldier and glue it onto this cutout and, and send it as kind of a remembrance card when soldiers passed away to the families of, of fallen officers, fallen military personnel. Um, and Hannah Hoech and Raoul Hausmann supposedly saw this particular practice when they were vacationing somewhere. There were, there were um, kind of uh, mounted images of these soldiers on the wall with these kind of cut out bodies and, and glued on faces of real photographs. And they sort of uh, either Hüch took it up herself or Hausmann and Hüch both took it up and sort of developed it further, integrating real photographs, which were had a, a kind of valuable currency at the time in a way that today probably they, they might actually have again because no one takes real photographs anymore, right? Everything is digital. But at the time, you wouldn't necessarily cut up a photograph that was, you know, kind of a valuable artifact. And um, so they started to use this particular practice in the 1910s where they were cutting up real photographs and gluing them together with, with gouache, with, um, with watercolor, with uh, colored paper, ink, graphite, um, and integrating different materials. So it was a very intermedial practice. Uh, and it, it allowed them also to expand and Hen Hoek in particular to expand you know, the, the kind of the indexical reference in her work. So if you think about the photograph as having a better kind of indexicality, sometimes we talk about Roland Barthes or other figures saying that the photograph is more real than a painting or it references reality in a way that a painting can't or a hand-drawn illustration can't. Um, Hanna Hoek and folks like her who were using this photomontage practice were actively integrating the real in their work and the kind of artistic manipulated uh, recognized kind of um, you know artistic hand in terms of painting or illustration so they were doing this very radical integration of the real and the kind of artistic in a way that hopefully you know if you think back to Peter Berger's discussion of the avant-garde and and the historical avant-garde in particular um, the Dadaists were this kind of example of really wanting to put art back into everyday life and vice versa, put everyday life back into art and incorporating physically the, 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 pho the photograph into the work is just a really wonderful, concrete, particular example of how the real was brought into art and, and, and art was integrated back in with the real in a sense. So uh, I find wow. it really fascinating. Wow. I, I just... This is the first time <laughs> I'm just geeking out over Hannah Hook stuff. Um, and it's the first time for me to see her, um, one of her photo mo montages with the African um, African artifacts. That's actually very interesting. Mostly anything in, in Google, you just see the, the one that the cut up with the kitchen knife and the other ones that doesn't use the African stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, does anyone have any question? It's ten fifty-seven. Um, I I think a lot of people are currently shy. However, yeah, totally um, okay. Oh, here's a question from Sir Nuki. Um, he says, "How do we situate a critical or post-colonial discourse among our learned?" learners in relation 
to the Western history of avant-garde. Oh, this is nice. Given yeah. that Philippines has its own critical narrative of the avant-garde. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, this is a very good question. And I, I think a lot about the notion of a national avant-garde or an avant-garde associated with a, with a particular kind of nation state. Um, so I'm not sure I can really answer that, that really excellent question in, in an effective way because I don't know enough about the Philippine tradition or the Filipina tradition of avant-gardism and, and the kind of particular history um, that, that you're referring to. But one of the things I, I see in the kind of Western uh, kind of iterations of the avant-garde that I really focus on in, in the early 20th century stuff, that in particular, is this aspiration to be more transnational. And I mean that in a kind of way that's not that that's extremely critical of colonialism, um, and I I think I would want to argue is articulating a difference that isn't a colonial usurpation of of another culture's practices, but rather integration of aesthetic practices across cultures, regardless of national borders. And the the really good example I have of that. Um, which is a, a kind of real labor of love that I have to give full credit to a woman named Adrian Sulhalter uh, for kind of putting this together. Um, Tristan Zara, who I mentioned in, in the talk last time and is a key figure in Dada in Europe, Dada being the sort of paradigmatic example of, of the avant-garde when it turns against itself and turns against art being so institutionalized, music, kind of separated from, from its critical potential in the world, in society, and in politics. Um, Adrian Sudhalter um, was able in 2016 to sort of put together archival material that Tristan Zara had left for what was called the Dada Globe project. And this was a project that Francis Picabia was involved in. Picabia left Europe uh, to live in, uh, I think he was in Brazil, uh, left in, I think it was 1919, uh, but don't quote me on the dates. And, and there was an effort to think more broadly. There was also, I, I think I mentioned last time, um, a number of figures, including a Japanese artist named uh, Tomiyoshi Mirayama, who studied with the Berlin Dadaists in the late 1910s, early 1920s, and then proceeded to go back to Japan and articulated um, some uh, kind of Dada strategies and developed what was known as the MAVO movement, M-A-V-O. And these were all sort of part and parcel of this Dada globe vision that Zara and Picabia and, and, and Miriam and others had started to articulate, that Dada would be a, a non-national uh, nation state specific movement, but rather be kind of transnational or global, but very critical, uh, you know, in juxtaposition to colonial practices at the time. So that's, that's maybe one way to think about that, that kind of connection. I don't know if it's an effective way um, to bring in sort of indigenous uh, kind of avant-garde isms and even kind of very particular national avant-garde isms. The, the Japanese Mamo, Mavo movement, for example, is relatively understudied. Jennifer Wiesenfeld is the only person I know of with, with maybe one or two uh, very small exceptions, but Jennifer Wiesenfeld is the only person I know of who's published anything uh, uh, in English on the Mavo movement in Japan. Um, uh, and then, um, I, as I kind of just mentioned in passing, um, the reason I sort of attach so much to Dada, as well as, as we see the kind of more contemporary global uh, race critical manifestations. I mentioned Shaman Dada Dada in China in uh, in the mid 1980s, which I'll mention briefly next week or uh, next month when we talk. And then the Black Dada movement, which has been um, sort of the brain and artistic child of uh, an artist named Adam Pendleton, who has uh, been actively engaged since about uh, 2007 2008 with integrating Dada strategies into a kind of race critical. Um, somewhat US specific, but I think aspirationally, not necessarily simply a US specific critical race uh, approach to Dada. And Pendleton, as some of you may know, if you follow any of the US um, art activities, has an exhibition that's just now opened at uh, MoMA in New York City, another show called Who is Queen, which talks about queerness uh, and uh, cisgendered transgendered uh, blackness in relation to Dada and some of the strategies. So 
Um, a different kind of body, not the nation state, I think for Pendleton uh, necessarily, but um, hopefully you understand that uh, that helps answer a little bit that really good question. I screen grabbed the question because I want to do some research on it after we're done tonight and dig a little further. Thank you so much. Are you game for one, probably one last <laughs> that is a good, um, question good, for a student? I, I sure am, and that's a really good question. So do you want to read so it? So Eunice said, I noticed that in Hannah Hook's collages presented, she uses African artifacts to juxtapose the colonial body rather than faces of African people. Is there a reason for this choice of imagery? No. Uh, that's a super good question as well. There are a couple of images in the series and in that house from an ethnographic museum series where she does use images of real people. And in fact, folk, what were called Folke Schauen, um, were very popular in Europe at the time and Germany in particular in this case. Folke Schauen were exhibitions of, of peoples, the shows of peoples, Folke Schauen, and oftentimes in circuses or zoos where people were staged or sometimes brought in from colonized countries to live on exhibition, as horrific as that sounds uh, and was. Um, so those those individuals oftentimes were photographed for the photo illustrated press. So Hen does use some um, real, real people, photographs and uh, photo illustrated representations of real colonized people and Africans in particular in her work. Um, I think the bulk of the material though is colonial artifacts that, that were identified um, and in um, that were basically stolen and, and put on display in uh, the zoo, in, I'm sorry, in the museums, in the ethnological museums in Europe at the time. And um, Maria Makala, who I mentioned previously, has done some, did some amazing work with the, the catalog um, for that 1994 retrospective show uh, called The Photo Montages of Hannah Hunt. Basically looked through um, a history of several dozen photo illustrated magazines and all the photo montages that Henry created to identify particular images um, like where was this 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 head where was it uh, where did Henry find it in what magazine and um, it was a real I, I don't know if I can emphasize enough how um, time consuming and um, intense that physical and and um, artistic labor was for Makala to, to do, but she did identify some of the source material by going through and seeing how those images were originally reproduced in, in some of the um, photo illustrated magazines in Germany at the time. So there's a real interesting connection and there's more work to be done on that too. I think Makala was able to scratch the surface, but for those folks interested in a deeper dive, some of the source material there is really fascinating. And that has contemporary relevance as well, given you know, all the discussions of repatriation that are now rightfully so erupting in Europe, uh, in Germany uh, and other places around repatriating uh, stolen artifacts and stolen artworks uh, to the countries and, and peoples from which they were taken. Um, I'll just say one last thing, because I see this really wonderful question about um, Peter Berger and art must have a social function. It's a really tricky, um, it's not a tricky thing, but it's taken me, I'm 48 years old and it's taken me 47 years to figure out what Peter Berger is talking about. <laughs> um, <laughs> I didn't start reading him when I was one, but sometimes it feels like it. Um, and he is very specific about aestheticism, which is why I wanted to mention it to you all, because he talks about that as being the catalyst for la pola, the detachment, when art was considered art for art's sake. And I, I can appreciate that. You may all appreciate it as well. I have students who want to kind of just make art because they want to make something beautiful or or want to make something challenging or thought provoking, but they're not interested in making it political or commentary, commenting on social issues in any way at all. And that was sort of the, the setup that Peter Berger had in mind. He talked about aestheticism, this kind of late uh, 19th century movement that was very much concerned with just making art for art's sake, art for just to be beautiful or you know decorative. And then uh, what happened with, with uh, kind of the issues around colonialism in the late 19th century, the onset of World War I in the 20th century, is that artists that he then kind of groups together under the auspices of the historical avant-garde become really upset that artists are not 
taking a more active role in um, commenting on uh, social injustices and political you know, catastrophes. So they sort of demand, this historical avant-garde demands, we can no longer be like the aestheticists, just making art to be beautiful or decorative. We need to make art that, that forces social and political change or calls attention to these issues. So uh, that, that sort of is the way I think about art must have a social function. It's really specific to Peter Berger's um, distinction between aestheticism in the 19th century and the rise of the, this very um, particular kind of this particular attitude in the 20th century that by avant-garde artists who are critical of art that just is, is passive because they view that art is, is, is complicit with all the social and, and political injustices that are happening, if that, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hackinson. Unfortunately, we have to end our Q&A, but um, if you want to ask more questions, um, Dr. Hackinson has provided us with his email. You can email him directly at T Hackinson, that's T H A A K E N S O N, at cca.edu. So, thank you everyone for attending our lecture series. We thank Dr. Hackinson again for this second lecture. I'm certain that some of our guests, including me, are very excited to listen to the next lecture. Yeah. So, may we remind everyone that the third and final lecture for this series understanding dada and the historical avant-garde will be held on november 24 2021 please follow our social media accounts for further details so thank you dr hackinson that was a beautiful lecture we will now proceed with the university hymn again thank you to everyone <laughs>